got Da Vinci's Last Supper, the famous painting of this significant event. Now, I'd like to ask you to put your glasses on carefully. Can you see any issues with this painting? Any, any, any mistakes? Anything that doesn't quite add up for a Passover? <laughs> they're so white? All right, they're Italians. <laughs> they're Italians. They shouldn't be there. We need to have some more browner Middle Easterners. Okay. <laughs> they shouldn't be, sorry? They shouldn't be sitting. They should be reclining. Okay, fair enough. What other points do we have? Yes? There's no wine on the table. There's no wine on the table. Maybe they're just drinking water. Fair enough. Any other issues? They're all sitting on the same side of the table. Not very practical. <laughs> I mean, we would do this. If we're going to do if we're going to do a painting, we would do this. Like, hey, everyone sit there nice and still for the next five hours as we paint you. But you don't do that in practice. There's a woman there. Okay. Yes. Fair enough. And everyone's got really long hair. A bit unusual. Dean? Ah, Dean's onto it. It was at night. Look at the clear blue sky. Ooh. It's a painting. Well, maybe. Uh, there's also, it's hard to see, but there's nice little fluffy bread rolls on the table. Ah. Now, for Passover, you need to have unleavened bread. No leaven. No leaven in the house. You need to clean out all the leaven. And what's leaven a symbol of? Sin, Sin exactly. And we, we have a privilege of living in the Jewish area of Melbourne. And so we've got Jewish neighbours, and as Passover comes around, they gather together the kids, and the day before they head outside, and they bring all these pieces of leaven. And they set up a bonfire, and all the kids together are throwing leaven on the fire, getting rid of the last few crumbs in the house. So there would be no leaven because we are to take the sin out before we partake of the Passover. We'll also see on the pitch they actually have fish. They're eating fish for Passover. But you'd have a lamb for Passover. So there's many issues with this painting. It still represents what happened. But we're going to look at one more thing that we haven't spoken about so far. And that's the table. They're sitting at this long stretched out table. But, in actual fact, it would be a very different seating arrangement. So I'm taking this from a book called Broken Bread by Jay McCall, which is on our next slide. You can look it up on Amazon. But he had a lot of information on this particular table seating. Next slide. If you've seen the film The Passion of the Christ, there, there is a beautiful scene where Jesus as a carpenter is working on this table. It's a really tall table. And Mary comes in very puzzled. What are you going to do with such a tall table? How can you sit at it? Because she was used to, in their culture, really, really, really small tables. Maybe 30 centimeter tall tables. Not what we have today. So, going on to the next slide. The guest room. Josephus, in his writings about the culture and the historical events of his day, he describes guest rooms that the Romans in particular would use, and they were for the rich, and they were called cataluma. Can you say cataluma? I don't know if we pronounce it right, but cataluma. This is the phrase used in Luke 22, 11, when Jesus sends out his disciples to prepare the Passover. And he says, you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room? Where is the kataluma? Where am I eat the Passover with my disciples? The katalumas would feature a 30 centimeter tall U-shaped table called the triclinium. In other words, it's three, three sides to it and it faces the door. You'd all, as you're sitting at this, as it was mentioned, you would be reclining on your left. Here's some ladies demonstrating for us. You'd lie on your left, you'd eat with your right. One reason for that is, back in the day, you didn't have toilet paper. Well, what do you do with your left hand? Well, we won't go there, but you don't eat with your left hand, you eat with your right. So everyone is reclining on their left hand, eating with their right. The feet away from the table and all in this U-shape. Now, one issue with this is how do you talk to the person behind you? Because you are lying on this left hand. Now, you'll have cushions all around you to keep you in position. 
So if you begin to sort of rotate around, you're going to upset the whole table arrangement. <laughs> so the method will be to drop your head back, <laughs> recline on their chest and say, hi, how are you going? <laughs> it sounds really strange and odd to us, but this is how you would recline at the table. And another point to mention is your feet will be as far away from the table as possible. Because feet in that day and age were the most insulting part of the human body. Do not bring it anywhere near the table. So the feet are stretched far away from the table. Next slide. So we've got the people in a U shape around the table. Now we would probably put the host uh, in the middle of the table, but the traditional position would be second from the door. So the door is here on, on your left, where you've got our green colored guy. The host would be number two from the door. This would be a very important or a very rich person who is hosting such a, a feast. But during Passover time, many were encouraged to celebrate in this way because the rabbis will say, you are free, but you are also rich. You are rich because you're blessed with freedom, because God has blessed you. And so everyone was celebrating in a way that resembles rich people. The host would arrange all the details of the meal, and he would be the one to break and bless the bread. He would be the one to pass the Passover cup. So who is our host at this event? It's Yeshua, right? It's Jesus, our Messiah. He is the host. He is the one who's sitting there, lying in the white tunic. In front of him, the guy in the green will be known as the bodyguard. He is facing the door. He is the best friend of the host. He is known as the host's right hand. He'll be armed with a sword. Because if anyone's coming in, the first person they'll encounter is our man lying there in green. In that day and age, there was a lot of danger around. A lot of people would be out to get revenge. And Jesus was controversial. He needed someone to protect him. And so lying next to the host, in front of him, would be a man who's willing to lay down his life for the host. In fact, he's lying there with his body directly in front of the host. So anyone who comes in with ill intent has to first deal with the bodyguard. He's also the wine taster, tasting the food for the host, protecting him with his life. So who is the bodyguard at the Passover? We read in John 13, 25, leaning back on Jesus' breast, John says to him, Lord, who is it who's going to betray you? Who is it? And as we just explained, he's lying on his left. He, that's his only way to talk to Jesus or Yeshua behind him, to recline back on his chest. And that becomes a very personal, intimate position. We would not do that. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> don't do it. Well, we can try it tonight at the Passover. That's what Tash is saying. <laughs> but in the Middle East, personal space is quite different than for us. Right, we want to keep a nice distance, high over there. Good to see you, don't get too close. But for them, they want to smell you. They want to be close to you. Hello, how's it going? <laughs> but there is an intimacy and a closeness to that that is really beautiful and perhaps is lacking in our Western sterile culture. And even more so in our socially distanced culture of today. And John describes himself later on at the end of the book of John, John 21, 20, Peter turns around, he sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who had leaned on his breast at supper. Why is he pointing out that fact? Because he has this really important, close, intimate role to the Messiah of lying, reclining on his chest, of being the one who's willing to lay down his life for the Master. The lowest place at the table. In every table seating, there's, high, there's good places, bad places, and the lowest place at the table is on the far, far right-hand side. If there was no servant present, then this person will be the one responsible to get up and wash people's feet. 
And as I mentioned, feet were something very, very insulting and disgusting to touch in that day and age. Some of you might remember a few years back when George Bush was president and he was visiting Iraq and he had a press conference. And in that press conference, a journalist stood up, grabbed his shoes and chucked them at George Bush. It was kind of a very random thing to do. Why would you throw a shoe of all things? Throw a tomato, throw an egg, get some action. Why a shoe? Because in Arab and Middle Eastern culture, to this day, the most insulting thing is to expose your foot towards someone. Because the foot represents the dirt of the day, the, the dirt that you pass through, the, the open sewers that would be in that day. Your feet would be absolutely grubby. And so someone who's washing feet would be the lowest of the lowest of all servants. It would be very refreshing to have your feet washed after a day of walking through the dusty, dirty streets. But the person doing it would not be a happy chappy because it was the worst job in the house. So who is lying in this position where they could become the foot washer? Well, we've got a hint because it says that Peter had eye contact with John. Peter motions to John. When the whole question comes up, who is going to betray the Messiah, who's going to betray our, our teacher, our rabbi? Peter gazes over to John and says, John, ask, ask, find out. <laughs> he couldn't <laughs> resist. But you have to remember, John is lying on his side. He's got Jesus and all the others behind him like this. His view is very restricted. He can't get off his left. So he can barely see straight ahead over there. And he can't communicate with people all over around there. The only one he can see and have direct contact with is the one in the lowest place at the table. What is Peter doing at the lowest place of the table? Good question. <laughs> Good question. I mean, he had heard Jesus say, you know, take the lowest place and, and, and then the host will come and put you in a place of honor. Maybe he had a scheme. He said, I'll put myself there. Jesus will come. He'll see my humility and he'll raise me up to the best <laughs> place in the house. If he did, that failed miserably because Jesus walked straight past him, got into the, the, the best seat where he was going to be and left Peter B where he was. <laughs> wow. Ouch. Or an even greater ouch would be if Jesus told Peter, I want you to be right there. That would be an even greater ouch. Now, Peter was the first one to put up his hand to lead, to talk, to do anything. But to be in the lowest place, I don't think he put his hand up for that. Where did Peter want to be? Luke twenty-two thirty-eight. After the Passover has ended, Jesus is asking, do we have a sword? And the response is, Lord, look, here are two swords. Now, at a Passover, you'd only have one sword, and that's the bodyguard. Why are there two swords? Did someone else bring a sword who wanted to be the bodyguard and was not put in that position? Ooh. John 18, 10, as they, they come to arrest Jesus, it says, Simon Peter, having a sword, <laughs> drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Peter had said, I'm, I'm going to follow you to death. I'll lay down my life for you. He was ambitious to be in this place. Sometimes when we have an ambition, God puts us in the opposite place, at least for a season at least for a time, because we've got some things to learn in that low place before we can be lifted up to that high place that he has for us. Ambition can, is a good thing when it comes to relating to God's plan and purpose for your life, but it has to do and it has to be under control in terms of the season and timing of God. Peter wanted to exalt himself, but Jesus put him in a different place. The time would come when Peter would be exalted. Some years ago, I, I joined a congregation just after I'd finished Bible college. I had been a youth leader. I had a Bachelor of Arts in Intercultural Ministry. Here I am, ministry world, come and get me. <laughs> I get to the congregation, and it was very interesting to hear the teaching. 
But the, the, the pastor and the leader, he would see straight through me. He would wave in my direction. So I'd wave very excitedly back. Here I am. But it turns out he's actually waving to the guy behind me, walking straight past. <laughs> yeah, it hurt. It hurt. And so I begin to think, well, maybe I should raise my hand and just let them know that I'm available. You know, I can do all this stuff. I'm really skilled. Every time I was thinking about that, praying about it, I'd open up the Bible and there would be scriptures standing out to me there about not exalting and promoting myself. So I put it on the shelf for another few months and I begin to think about it again and again those scriptures would pop out at me and I really felt God warn me and tell me, this is not your time. So here I was coming straight out of Bible college and for the next five years, having been in ministry, I was doing nothing. I was not seen, I was hidden, people were wondering, what are you doing? But God had a season and a time for me to prepare. He had things he wanted me to learn. I thought I knew it all. I didn't. I had a lot of things to learn. And the time came when God opened those doors. But it wasn't me opening the doors, it was him. I think Peter tried to open the door. He tried to put himself in that place and Jesus said, nah, -uh, not for you today. Going back to washing feet. We mentioned our, our protester who threw the shoes at George W. Bush and he actually got three years jail for that. Wow. But because culturally this was the worst of the worst thing he could possibly do. Now we read in John 13, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he would depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going from God, rose from supper. He laid aside his garments, he took a towel and girded himself, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Now he knew he was going to the highest place. He knew where he had come from. He knew where he was going back to. He also knew that culturally this was not his role. There was no need for him to touch this dirty job. Let someone else do it, Master. Let someone else do it, great teacher. And perhaps... It was meant to be that Peter was supposed to do it. But Peter, there he is in the lowest position. The time has come for feet to be washed and he's not budging. <laughs> I'm not going to touch any of those feet with a long stick. Thank you very much. I'm not meant to be in this place. I'm the bodyguard. I'm the best, the best man, so to speak, in the house. So he's not moving. And then to everyone's surprise, the host begins to get up. Jesus gets up laying aside his garments, taking the servant bowl which would be placed very close to where Peter was and begins the filthy, dirty, humiliating task of washing their feet one by one. Who knows what Peter was thinking in that moment? Because if we read on in verse 6, he came to Simon Peter. This is a bit of a confrontation going on. And Peter says to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter replies, Lord, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him saying, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Peter goes on to say, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He's excited. He's enthusiastic. <laughs> he wants the whole deal. But in a sense, he was put in his place right there. Saying, Peter, if you want to follow me, you need to be willing, not just to do the high and mighty things, but be willing to bow down low. I was at a, a congregation once, and I was observing the, the minister in charge, and he is, he is known nationally. He's, he's got a, a significant profile. 
And just in front of him, some kids had dropped some cookies in the carpet and had begun to get smashed into the carpet. And straight away he scooped out and began to clean up those who were his hands. He wasn't too high and mighty to clean up the dirt on the floor. I know another minister who is in a situation where he has to get up during the night and care for his disabled daughter, changing nappies for her during the night. He could say, this is not for me to do, but he steps in. I'm a new parent, as many of you know, and I've had to be willing to do the hard yards, willing to do the dirty job. But there is a reward as we are faithful in these little things. There is a reward as we serve him in this. During that time, that season of five years and no ministry, I was busy in business. And I felt the joy and the presence of God in the business. And I knew that I was serving him even there. Paul writes to bond servants in his day. Those were the slaves who really, you could say, had no future. Many of them were stuck in an arrangement they could not get out of. And Paul speaks to them, and he doesn't say, hey, I want you to escape from where you are, get out on the road and preach the gospel with me. No, he told them, I want you to be faithful where you are, to honor God in what you do. For in in everything you do, you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So in peeling potatoes, you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. In doing the dishes, in doing menial things around the home, you are serving him. And Paul goes on to say, for whatever you do, you will receive a reward. You'll receive reward here on earth and in heaven. There is reward as we serve him today. There is reward as we're willing to do those things. And I know many of you are helping in different ways. Many of you already have a servant's heart. I want to encourage you with that, that that is pleasing in God's sight. And there is a reward for it. It's not all about being on the stage. It's all about following him. So next slide, John 13, 12. When he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and sat down again. He said, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher, you call me Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash each other's feet. In other words, be willing to do the dirty job for someone else. Dipping bread. We've got one more key aspect we need to bring out of this table seating. So in that day and in that age, breaking bread with an enemy was a way to make peace. In fact, you, many of you will know that Israel has peace treaties with, with Egypt. And that treaty has stood the, the test of time, but they also made a treaty with the Palestinians. And that treaty has not, that treaty was not worth the paper it was written on. The difference was that when Israel made a treaty with Egypt and signed the papers at the White House, afterwards there was a private meeting between the Prime Minister of Israel and the President of Egypt. And they came together and they broke bread. And in this culture, and in even to this day, that meant that if you partake of this bread and I partake of it too, we are one. That animosity, that hatred, that division is gone. And so it was a way of having a covenant, a way of having peace between brothers, was breaking bread. There would also be a statement which would sum up the meaning if you would break bread and pass it on to someone. It would be to say, you are my brother and I would gladly lay down my life for you. You are my friend, I honor you, I esteem you, I love you. And it was one of the greatest honors in their culture and their society of that day. So someone break the bread and give you a piece and put it in your mouth. Maybe dip it in a dip and put it in your mouth. Can you imagine again, they're all reclining on the left-hand side and suddenly the host breaks a piece of bread. He dips it in and he shoves it in the mouth behind him. <laughs> We're not going to demonstrate it right here, right now. We would go like, oh, oh what, what was that? What was that all about? But the statement behind that was, you are my brother, you are my friend, I honor you, I esteem you, I love you. Let's go back 
to our table again because there's a position for the guest of honour. He'd be number three from the door. So he'd be lying behind Jesus, behind Yeshua. The host would recline his head back on his chest and protect him from danger. We know in Matthew 20, 21 that the mother of Zebedee and John, they co he, she comes to Jesus like any good mum. Says, grant that these two sons of mine may sit at your left and your right in the kingdom. Being at the left side or the right side were the positions. They were coveted and wanted. So again, the question came, and Jesus said that at the Passover meal, one of you will betray me. And so Peter motions over to John. John, ask. So John leans back on Jesus' chest, and he asks the question, who is it? And Jesus said, it is he to whom I'll give this piece of bread when I have dipped it. And so he dips the piece of bread in and he shoves it around in the mouth of the guest of honor, Judas. He is placed in the highest place of the evening. So when Jesus makes this statement, no one understands him. No one understands that Judas will actually betray him because you do not do this to your enemy. You don't do this to someone who's about to betray you, who you know is going to betray you. But Jesus puts him in the position of honor, treats him with honor, puts him in this, a place where he shows willingness to protect him with his life. And we know that Judas was already in charge of the treasure box. You wouldn't do that with just anyone. You're saying that I trust you. I believe in you. The guest of honor. In, in action movies, we enjoy sometimes watching the bad guys getting all smashed up. They're really, really bad, and they get in trouble, and bang, the hero smashes them down to the floor, and that's the end. It's a great movie, and we're all really happy because the bad guys are out. But Jesus' attitude towards the ultimate bad guy, towards the one who's in his heart was to betray the Messiah, and the one who ultimately, it says, the devil himself enters, this guy represents pure evil. But Matthew 26, 48, in the garden of Gethsemane, the betrayer had given the, the mob a sign saying, whoever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. And immediately he goes up to Jesus, says, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus' reply is beautiful. He says, friend, friend. Why have you come? You see, his love, even for Judas, his love, even for his enemies. At the Passover Seder, there is a time when one is remembering the plagues that came on Egypt. But as one does, one doesn't celebrate and jump up and down and dance. But there is a tear being shed in remembrance of each of those plagues, of the danger, of the, the damage done to these people, because they too are made in the image of God. And I think that is Jesus' perspective here when he sees Judas and he knows the evil in this man, yet he sees a man made in the image of God. Some years ago, my, my mum was praying and she just really, she had a dream and she experienced the love of God for the then president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe. Now he was a man who's known for a lot of controversial and you could say wicked things that he had done for many, many years in power. Yet she just felt supernaturally the love of God for this man. We are living in a time when politics is getting very polarized. Where we're all supporting one side, we're cheering them on and we're booing the other side. Get them out of here, we don't want them. And while it's good to stand for kingdom values and to pray and to influence society, we need to watch our attitude towards those on the other side. Recently in Victoria, our Premier uh, fell down some steps and he had some back injuries and so on. And some of my Christian friends on Facebook were openly celebrating, saying, this is good, this is great. And next stop is hell for him. I'm like, hang on a moment. This attitude is not the attitude of Jesus our Messiah.
Matthew 5:44 I say to you love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good sends rain on the just and on the unjust if you love those who love you what reward have you God has put us here on earth with imperfect people all around us, with people who at times grate us the wrong way, they say the wrong things, they act the wrong way, they are annoying and frustrating and we don't want them in our lives, but God has put them around us because he wants us to learn to love them. He wants to learn to forgive them when they have hurt us. There's coming a day when you know, we will be in the kingdom, we'll be with the Messiah, we'll be in eternity. But right now is our time to learn to love, to learn to demonstrate that love. It's easy to, easy to say, we love God, we love Him. But in the book of 1 John, John tells us, well, you say you love God, but why are you having so much problems loving your neighbor, loving the people around you? We can demonstrate our love for God right now with how we handle the good guys and the bad guys the nice ones and those who really are a problem in our lives. For the Jewish people, as they head into Passover, it's a time to repair and clean the houses, get the leaven out, get the sin out of the camp. It's a time where they will search their hearts and make sure things are in order. So as we're getting ready for Passover tonight, I'd like to encourage you and challenge you. This is a time to forgive. To let go. Someone who's hurt you, said the wrong thing. Also, it's a time to get right. Perhaps you have hurt someone. You know there's a broken relationship and at least part of it is your fault. You feel that they have their share of the blame, but still you know the things that you could have done and said differently. Now's the time then to pick up the phone to make contact and say, hey, I am sorry. You might get a response. You might get an apology from them as well. You might not. But it is as you begin to take that first step that it sets them free to begin to forgive you and to come back in a relationship with you. In marriage relationships, we all start off very, very rosy and very, very romantic. But things happen as the time goes by, as the pressures of family. And we can harbor resentment and ill feelings. We're frustrated with their mannerism, with the things they do. We feel that it's their fault, it's they are to blame. But one thing I've been learning of these past years in marriage with Sarah is I have to ask myself the question, where have I failed? I might be very aware of what I feel she has done wrong, but where have I missed it? And this, that's the starting point. And so I go to her and I say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have got angry. I shouldn't have said this. I shouldn't have done that. And as I do, it touches her heart and we can become one again. Passover is about breaking bread. And as you're breaking bread, we are to be one, one with each other because we all eat the same bread. But for that to happen, we need to prepare our hearts. We've got a few hours before Passover tonight. Let's take that time to prepare our hearts. Jesus said in John 13, 15, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So what I'd like to do is we'll, we'll be ending off now in prayer. But also if there are some of you who would like, like us to pray for you, you're welcome to come forward after service and we'll, we can pray with you. But first, we'll just like to close in prayer. We can welcome the worship team forward. And I'll also hand over to Pastor Carl afterwards. So can, can we all stand together? I know you've been sitting for quite some time. So Jesus... Yeshua, our Savior, we thank you for the example you have given us.
the love you showed to your enemies, the love you showed to those who hated you, to those who persecuted you, and the example you set. And wherever we have not followed that example, wherever we have harbored ill will and ill sentiment towards them, towards people in our lives, Lord, right now we just place those people before you, those names, those situations where we've been hurt, and we ask you, Lord, firstly to forgive them, and we re ourselves release our forgiveness towards them. And Lord, wherever we might have hurt others, and where, where we haven't um, done amends, we haven't made amends, we've just moved on and we've left someone behind who's hurt, someone behind who's disappointed in what we did and said. Lord, we want to make amends. We want to be right with that person. We love them. And we want to ask for their forgiveness. I pray, Lord, that you'll restore relationships in this house, that you'll restore relationships in the families represented here, that the, the divisions and the walls have been put up through experience, through hurt, through pain and bitterness, that those walls will be taken down. As we take the step to tear down those walls by saying, please forgive me, because I too have sinned, I too have failed. I did the wrong thing. Please forgive me. And as we do, we ask you for healing of relationships, Lord, that we'll be one in you. And Lord, wherever we've had ambition and we've wanted the highest place, right now, Lord, we just present our desires to you. And we simply say, Lord, here I am. Use me. I want to follow you and serve you whatever that means. I want to do what I'm doing as unto you, not to please people, not to get their praise, not to get recognition, but to bring a smile to your face because I have done what you have told me to do, that you'll be able to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. We thank you, Jesus, our Messiah, for your blood that was shed on the Passover. That this is the basis from which we have forgiveness. This is the basis for which we have salvation. We thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. That you served us, you loved us first. And here we are just to follow you in loving us.